All right, we are live and we are recording. Hi, everybody. My name is Jess Alvarez Parfrey. I'm a programs coordinator with Transition US. I'm really excited to be here with you all uh, to have this really important discussion about glyphosate and its impacts on soil and human health. Again, this webinar is hosted by Transition US and it's been put together by the work of folks involved with our politics and policy working group. So thanks to them and a shout out to Theo. And now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists and the group that will be delivering uh, this presentation this evening. Just give me one second. Mm -mm -mm. There we are. So, Chris Anderson, Carol Berry, and Carl Buchholz are members of a climate action group called Earth Matters and Transition Town from uh, Manchester, which was formed four years ago. This is in reference to Earth Matters, a go due to whatever is, to do whatever is possible on a local level to address the climate crisis. Several members of Earth Matters have been learning about and practicing regenerative agriculture which is both a way of growing healthier food and a way to store carbon in the soil that reduces global warming. One basic component of regenerative agriculture is growing food without the use of chemical fertilizers or pesticides. In the course of their research, our presenters learned that a powerful herbicide called glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, was the most widely used pesticide in both the United States and around the globe. The trio has put together a PowerPoint to educate as many people as possible about the danger glyphosate poses to the soil, to water, to insects, birds, and other animals, as well as to people and the planet. Their hope is that a growing number of individuals and organizations will watch the PowerPoint and decide that we need to change our dependence on harmful pesticides. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. This is a presentation to inform and share our concerns about the use of toxic chemicals, pesticides, in the environment, in our communities, in our food production. And we hope that with greater awareness of the harmful effects that toxic chemicals have, we can all become advocates for healthier alternatives in land management and food production. There are three parts to this presentation. My name is Carol Berry, and I will give a general overview. Chris will talk about the history of glyphosate or glyphosate and explain its impact on soil health and Carl will talk about the impact of glyphosate on human health. Seeing our food crops being sprayed with chemical solutions by people wearing hazmat suits can't but make us wonder what potential hazards we are exposed to and what is happening in our environment, in our in agriculture and in our food production. Although the United States is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, the number of people who suffer from all kinds of diseases is rising, especially autoimmune diseases, from which one in five people suffer in the United States. There's a lot of research being done about the implications that our health is being compromised by the presence of toxic chemicals, for example, glyphosate containing herbicides, in our environment and in our food supply. What's in a pesticide? And a pesticide, by the way, includes herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. And they are all made up of formulations containing the following. Active ingredients, which are the chemicals that destroy the target organisms. And the active ingredient in Roundup is glyphosate. Then we have the so-called inert ingredients, which are chemicals that make the absorption of the active ingredient possible. In the case of Roundup, the inert ingredients break down the cell walls of plants so that glyphosate can enter. And these inert ingredients add to the toxicity of pesticides. 
Then besides the contaminants and impurities, we have the metabolites, which are often more hazardous. They are the breakdown products of the active ingredients when they come into contact with air, water, and soil. In this presentation, we will focus on glyphosate, which is the most widely used herbicide in the world as part of the formulation called Roundup. This presentation is given not only to create an awareness of the harm glyphosate and other pesticides pose, but to also offer ways to become actively engaged and empowered to make changes. But we can only do this by being informed. At the end of this presentation, we will show you a list of organizations that offer a lot of information as well as solutions and alternatives to making healthier choices in land management, food production and consumption. This on the screen is an example of a fact sheet containing information about the health effects of commonly used pesticides. It is produced and um, published by an organization called Beyond Pesticides. And with such information, you can become a more effective advocate for a healthier environment. These numbers will give you some information about the scope of the use of glyphosate in the United States. Between the first application of glyphosate in Roundup in 1974 until 2014, there is a 200 fold increase in usage. In Vermont, the usage of glyphosate increased by 10,000 pounds in five years. On the graph, you can see that the increase in using Roundup occurred especially after Monsanto's Roundup Ready Corn and cotton seeds became available. And you'll hear more about that from Chris. Glyphosate containing herbicides are also sprayed on a range of fruits, nuts, and vegetables. And the soil is pretreated with glyphosate before planting some crops like spinach. In California alone in 2012, Roundup was sprayed on approximately 5 million acres for all kinds of crops. And in addition, glyphosate containing herbicides are being sprayed on fields, around our utility poles, along highways and railways, in forestry, on lawn care and golf courses. We almost can't escape glyphosate treated areas. And to make things worse, glyphosate is also harming beneficial insects like the pollinators. Glyphosate containing herbicides are additionally used as pre-harvest treatments to desiccate, meaning to speed up the drying of wheat, oats, barley, and potato crops. This helps farmers harvest their crops more efficiently and at less cost. But spraying glyphosate right before harvest means the food directly absorbs the glyphosate residues. And that means you can't wash them off, you ingest them. Think about that. Since we are in Vermont, I have an example from Vermont in 2018. There were still about 280 different pesticides listed on the website of the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Many have not been fully tested for safety. The overall pesticide use in Vermont is very high. As you can see, it doubled in five years alone. And with the overuse of pesticides, things happen. The fertility of crop soil is being depleted this results in producing crops that have a lower nutritional content. In addition, a depleted soil is less able to sequester carbon, which has a major impact on climate change. And then the overuse of glyphosate specifically has created a huge problem. The target weeds have developed a resistance to the toxins 
and are becoming super weeds. And that is why a whole new arsenal of other potent pesticides are being used to combat these super weeds. Here is a listing of some of these other pesticides that are added or replacing Roundup. And it's much longer really, but some of the well-known ones are 2,4-D, Dicamba. This particular pesticide has a tendency to drift and affect organic fields in the neighborhood. Atrazine is used on fields. It's seeping into wells, and it is a known as the hormone disruptor. In Europe, it is banned. Then we have chlorpyrifos, which is a neurotoxin, and it's harming the development of children's brains, affecting humans and all other life forms, including decimating pollinators. Conventionally grown, apples, peppers, oranges, grapes, and cherries have chlorpyrifos residues on them. All these chemicals are harming us. Before Roundup and these other pesticides became widely used, there was the insecticide DDT, originally used in the 1940s to kill insects that carried diseases. DDT pesticides were used in farming, home gardens, and forests. And as you can see, the slogan, DDT is good for me, it is as safe as table salt, coined by the manufacturers, informed us that this toxin was considered safe. Today, we know DDT is a human carcinogen and detrimental to the environment. It was banned in 1972, but residues are still found in the environment 50 years later. It was Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, that drew attention to the indiscriminate use of pesticides and the harmful effects of DDT and its pervasiveness in the environment and in human bodies. Rachel Carson in her book called for humans to act more responsibly and carefully and as stewards of the living earth. And one of the concluding remarks in her book stuck with me. She said, there is no safe amount for the use of any chemical toxin. Because of the accumulative effect from every drop or spray applied, and because nature's balance is destroyed when unnatural toxins interfere. In the 1990s, a familiar slogan was perpetuated by the manufacturers of Roundup, Monsanto. Roundup is safer than table salt. And they said it's practically non-toxic to mammals, which includes us, human beings, birds and fish. We were also told that it is environmentally friendly and biodegradable. Since most of us are not chemists, we could only believe and trust this was true, just like we did with DDT. Chris and Cara will talk about the fact that glyphosate is not environmentally friendly and is not non-toxic to mammals. Roundup, by the way, is available in most stores that sell gardening products. But glyphosate isn't only found in Roundup, it is registered to be used in hundreds of other products. All over the world, agencies are grappling with issues of safety when it comes to the amount of any pesticides in food and water. And there are many different opinions and regulations. Here you have an example from the year 2017 of what was considered the safe average daily intake for glyphosate in food and the maximum residue level of glyphosate in drinking water in the European Union and in the United States. Based on these numbers, we in the United States have been exposed to three and a half times more glyphosate residues in our food 
and 7,000 times more residue of glyphosate in our water than the people in the European Union. This is one of the reasons why so many people suffer with health issues. And these kinds of statistics should make us question and become engaged with the pesticide regulations in our country. And remember, formulations such as Roundup are more toxic than glyphosate alone due to the added ingredients. Most research has been done just on glyphosate. So the increase in toxicity needs to be taken into account. What equally needs to be taken into account is that as you saw on the previous slide, pesticides such as glyphosate and Roundup are not the only toxic synthetic pesticides we are exposed to. And then in addition, we're also exposed to chemicals that are mixed into processed foods. All these substances accumulate in our bodies and have synergistic effects. And that is when several substances are combined, they react with each other in our bodies and enhance the toxic overload. There is good news though, for more and more we do read about investigations and new rulings regarding uh, pesticides. As you can see all over the world, there are countries that are banning or restricting glyphosate. In a huge win for small farmers in Mexico, the president issued a decree that will phase out the use of glyphosate and genetically modified corn by the end of 2024. As of 2018, cities and counties in these states on your left have also got restrictions in place to ban glyphosate or outright ban glyphosate. New York State is planning on banning glyphosate on state-owned lands by the end of the year. And in Vermont, for example, there are two bills which have been introduced to ban the sale or application of glyphosate as well as the herbicide atrazine. So instead of these lawn signs, we hope to see this or such a lawn sign. We can all advocate for an organic and regenerative approach to agriculture and land management so that we will have healthier soil, will have healthier and more resilient plants, which in turn will be nutritious and healthy for us all. And now Chris will take you through the history of glyphosate and how it affects our soil. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> all right, let's learn a little bit about glyphosate. The glyphosate molecule contains carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. And its chemical name is nitrogen phosphonomethyl glycine. The best known product that contains glyphosate is Roundup by Monsanto, a company that is now owned by the Bayer Corporation. But many other companies have developed and marketed their own glyphosate-based herbicide products with names like Rodeo, Pronto, Cleanup, and Eraser. Glyphosate was first synthesized by the Stauffer Company in 1961, and it was discovered to be a chelator, a descaling agent. In 1964, Monsanto began selling glyphosate as a chelator to remove elements like calcium and iron from water boilers and water pipes. In 1970, Monsanto discovered that glyphosate was also an herbicide that kills both grasses and broadleaf plants. The plant dies because glyphosate disrupts a biochemical pathway, the shikimate pathway. Without this pathway, plants cannot produce proteins that they need for growth. Glyphosate starves plants. 
both plants and microorganisms have this shikimate, shikimate pathway, but animals, including humans, do not. And for this reason, Monsanto claimed that glyphosate could not harm people. It took a few years for Monsanto to perfect its secret formula with glyphosate and Roundup first came on the market in 1974. As Carol mentioned, Roundup has many other chemicals added to it to help the active ingredient glyphosate do its job. Much of the research that has been done on glyphosate-based herbicides have been done with the glyphosate alone and has not included the effect that the additional so-called inert ingredients could have on the safety of glyphosate-based herbicides. In 1996, Monsanto released their first Roundup Ready seeds, soybeans. These seeds have been genetically engineered or modified. And after soybeans, Monsanto quickly genetically engineered corn, canola, sugar beets, cotton, and alfalfa. The plants that grow from these seeds are genetically altered so that they are resistant to glyphosate. When glyphosate is sprayed on a field of corn or cotton, the corn or cotton is not harmed. Only the weeds that are growing in the field are killed. Unfortunately, unfortunately, many weeds are quickly becoming resistant to glyphosate. In fact, recently I read there are 65 different weeds that fall into this category. So farmers are using additional herbicides that operate in different ways to kill them. So Monsanto has genetically engineered seeds additionally so that they are, those crops are now resistant to other herbicides and to insecticides, as well as to glyphosate. This US map shows the use of glyphosate in 1996, before Roundup Ready seeds were introduced. And the lighter the color here, the lower the use of glyphosate. And the, greater, the areas of greater use are shown with the dark brown, such as the Central Valley in California. 21 years later, in 2017, with Roundup Ready seeds in use, the dark brown areas have greatly increased where glyphosate is being used more heavily. The Food and Drug Administration reported that in 2018, 94% of soybeans, 94% of cotton, and 92% of corn grown in the United States is grown with glyphosate. Finally, in 2010, Monsanto was granted another patent for glyphosate as an antibiotic. Glyphosate kills bacteria and fungi. It kills microorganisms. That is three patents for glyphosate, chelator, herbicide, and antibiotic. But companies still claim that it is safe for us to eat food grown with glyphosate. Let's look at what the research shows about glyphosate's effects on soil health and plant health to see how it could be affecting our health. We have to go back in time to microbes, which were the life, first life forms on the planet. Uh, plants and animals evolved with microbes, setting up mutually beneficial or symbiotic relationships to perform essential tasks for each other. The microbes that help plants live in the soil around the plant roots in the zone called the rhizosphere. These microbes include bacteria and fungi, among many other types. And so the microbes, the plant root, and the soil is referred to as a soil microbiome. The soil microbiome contains billions of microbes. In just one health teaspoon of healthy soil, there are as many microbes as there are people on the planet. That, that's over 7 billion microbes in just a teaspoon of healthy soil. 
Now, we all, we all learn that plants using the energy of the sun take carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil to produce carbohydrates or sugars. The plant uses some of these carbohydrates, but 30 to 70% of the carbohydrates the, the plant produces are given off into the soil to soil microbes. And this is illustrated on the right side of the slide as a symbiotic exchange between substances in which the plants and microbes communicate with each other. So the microbes are getting the carbon from the sugars that the plant gives them. But what do the plants get in return? Let's just consider the fungi. This electron microscopic photo shows the fungal roots called hyphae. There are miles of these fungal roots in the rhizosphere around the plant roots. The hyphae greatly increase the root capacity of the plant. And incidentally, this is one of the reasons that tilling is bad for the soil. Tilling tears up these fung fungal hyphae. The plant depends on the hyphae to get nutrients and water. The fungal hyphae give off enzymes to dissolve rock surfaces. The enzymes bind with these minerals that are listed here and make them available to the plants. Minerals like calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, zinc, sodium, and iron. The plant does its job of making carbohydrates available to the to the fungi. And the fungi in exchange provides these important nutrients to the plants and to us when we eat the plants. However, when glyphosate is sprayed on the plants, it makes its way out through the plant roots into the soil. Since glyphosate is a chelator, when it gets into the soil, the glyphosate latches on to these important minerals making them unavailable to the plant, therefore unavailable to us. We expect that the, we will get these types of nutrients when we eat plants, but food that is grown with glyphosate is not as nutritious as food that is grown without glyphosate. Now, instead of just one apple a day, we might need 25 to give us the same nutrition. Now, there are many other tasks that microbes do for plants. Rhizobium bacteria live in the nodules of bean and pea plants and help the plant fix nitrogen from the air. Other microbes help plants defend themselves from diseases and harmful insects. Some microbes aggregate or glue soil particles together to make pathways for better water penetration which helps plants during drought conditions. Microbes are necessary for healthy soil and healthy, nutritious plants. But remember the patent by Monsanto in 2010? Glyphosate is an antibiotic. It kills soil microbes. It destroys the soil microbiome. Fewer microbes mean less healthy soil, less healthy plants, less healthy food, leading to animals and people that are not as healthy. To summarize, glyphosate is a chelator, a caustic scaling agent. Glyphosate is an herbicide, it kills plants. And glyphosate is an antibiotic, it kills microbes in the soil. And there's increasing evidence that glyphosate disrupts the microbes in our bodies, which you will now hear about from Carl. We've heard about the overall picture of glyphosate and its effect on soil and plants, and then let's look at its effect on us. So a little biology lesson. Our body contains trillions of bacteria. They are literally everywhere. They're on our skin, our eyes, uh, and inside all of our organs, especially the stomach, intestines, and colon, which is called the digestive tract or gut. It's estimated that there are 40 
trillion microorganisms inside of our digestive tract. This is a, a little picture of what it could look like inside the intestine. All those purplish, brownish, balloon-like things are called villi, and that's what lines the entire inside of the intestine. And they filter out uh, what they need to, to allow the good nutritious parts to enter our body and the things that are harmful to leave us. Now all those red, green, blue, yellow little things are the microbes. Remember, 40 trillion of them. I would tell you one research that amazed me. They did a study with identical twins, same genes. One was obese and one was thin. They took the gut biology, the bacteria from each of them and put them in two different mice. The mouse that got the bacteria from the gut microbiome of the obese twin became obese. And the mouse that got the bacteria from the thin twin stayed thin. This is despite the fact that the mice were given the exact same food and the exact same quantity. So it shows you how important the microbial life is in our intestine. We co-evolved with these microbes. Like Chris said, they were here first on this planet and we evolved in relationship with them. It's a symbiotic relationship. We need them, they need us. We feed them. And in return, they repair the intestinal lining. They produce indispensable vitamins and amino acids. Indispensable means we can't live without them, pure and simple. And they also instruct the thymus to produce T cells. So they're basically in charge of our immune system. So think about that. These trillions of bacteria, viruses, fungi, they're inside of us and they are not harmful. We need them. Glyphosate's an antibiotic. It kills bacteria. So obviously it's going to affect us. The gut microbiome is clearly affected by what we eat. And if we, if we ingest poison like glyphosate, we're going to kill the beneficial bacteria and create an imbalance that's called dysbiosis. That's the opposite of symbiosis. Dysbiosis is associated with almost all of our 21st century chronic health problems. Children are especially vulnerable to glyphosate because their immune systems are not fully developed, especially from birth to five years old. So here's a partial list of chronic health problems that are really affecting so many children. ADHD, uh, I did a lot of testing of school kids for ADHD, um, autism spectrum disorder, these are on the rise. Type two diabetes, never used to see that prevalent in kids. Crohn's disease, uh, mental health disorders, peanut allergies and other serious food allergies. It's just a host of these chronic illnesses that affect a kid's ability to function. These health problems either didn't exist at all or they were present in just a tiny proportion of the US population prior to Roundup. As an example, this graph shows the incidence of autism among six-year-olds. So the yellow bars are the number of kids who are identified as having an autism spectrum disorder. And this is only up to 2010. I don't have anything more current, but you know it's been going up. And the red line is the amount of glyphosate sprayed in this country. So in 1974, before Roundup, only one child in 5,000 had autism. One in 5,000. And now it's one in 54. And I heard an estimate that if things continue on this track, by the year 2035, it's gonna be one child in three. That's pretty astonishing. 
This book was written by a, a pediatrician named Michelle Perro, who has 35 years experience working with kids, especially with chronic conditions that no other doctor could figure out. So she and her co-author say that the systemic health failures among our children are a result of something even more troubling than the physical symptoms in their bodies. They, meaning the health failures, are the cumulative outcome of being born into and living in an environment that has been made toxic by agrochemical industrialized food production. What does that look like? What does agrochemical industrialized food production look like? It looks like this. GMO seeds planted in dead soil that requires chemical fertilizers for anything to grow, and then liberally sprayed with glyphosate and other pesticides to kill herbs, insects, and any other problem that they can think of. You saw this graph, and again, this ends in 2010. By now, because of Roundup Ready crops, which are genetically modified, the use of glyphosate has just exploded. It's practically 100% of soybeans and cotton and almost 100% of corn. It's not a coincidence that the United States is in the middle of a health crisis that mirrors the climate and the environmental crisis. As an example, I'll show you these four graphs showing the correlation between the use of glyphosate, that's the red line, that's glyphosate, the blue line is percentage of GM, genetically modified corn and soybeans. The yellow bars in this graph are incidence of thyroid cancer. And if you look at the green line, that's horizontal, that's the trend of thyroid cancer before Roundup Ready C. This is Parkinson's disease, also well above what the trend line was and going up in sync with glyphosate. Diabetes skyrocketing compared to what it had been. And again, mirroring the use of glyphosate. And then renal disease deaths, this is kidney failure. Again, paralleling the increase of glyphosate and Roundup. This is a, again, a partial list of chronic 21st century illnesses among all people. This is adults, not just kids. Serious debilitating diseases, anxiety, Crohn's disease, depression, migraines, especially autoimmune diseases, which are even more susceptible to the microbial life in our intestine. So why are Americans having so many health problems? The answer is when we eat food grown with conventional agriculture, we're consuming glyphosate and other harmful pesticides. They're using GMO seeds, which are saturated with glyphosate. And then as Carol said, wheats, oats, barley, and potatoes, they don't even need glyphosate to grow. They just spray them to make it easier to harvest. And then the chicken, the beef, and the pork, that we eat, if, again, if it's not local and grass-fed and organic, the chickens and the beef cattle and the pigs are fattened up with antibiotics that help them put on weight as well as keep them relatively healthy. And they're eating all this food that was grown with glyphosate. And I'm not even gonna go into these other crops called Franken crops that the plant itself was modified. So it becomes its own insecticide. So a little research to show why ingesting glyphosate is not a good idea. This study uh, was very central when it came out, 2015. Epidemiological evidence supports strong temporal correlations between glyphosate use and the increase in all of these cancers, breast cancer, pancreatic, kidney, thyroid, liver, bladder, leukemia cancer. Uh, now remember, Epidemiologists are called disease detectives. They are the doctors and researchers who look at what causes a disease, 
who's the most vulnerable, and what can we do about it? So epidemiologists are very important when you look at studies like this. 2019 study, this is significant because a lot of those graphs showed a correlation. Glyphosate goes up, cancers go up. This study was one that demonstrated causation. They gave the mice water with glyphosate in it. 50% of them developed breast cancer tumors. Central study here, findings from experimental animal studies and meta-analysis of human epidemiological studies suggest a compelling link between exposures to glyphosate-based herbicides, like Roundup, and the increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's not just scientists who are coming to this conclusion. All three plaintiffs that sued Monsanto for becoming sick with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup, all three won huge settlements, multi-million dollar settlements against Monsanto. They actually proved that Monsanto knew there was a danger. And then now the Bayer Corporation that bought Monsanto, last time I heard, they offered $11 billion to try to settle some of these 125,000 lawsuits against them. Another study a couple of years ago, 93% of pregnant women had levels of glyphosate in their urine that were detectable. And it correlated, the higher the glyphosate, the shorter the gestation period of the pregnancy. And it's not just women. The fertility rate in general in the US and Western Europe is going down. They estimate that men have lost about 59% of their fertility, called like 60%. And the sperm count is lower, and then the sperm that are there also have lost their ability to, to navigate and swim appropriately. So it's the problem for both sexes. This research really freaked me out because I have grandkids. The researchers gave the first generation of mice and lab rats water with glyphosate. They didn't develop any symptoms. Their children, no symptoms. But the third and the fourth generation didn't have glyphosate, but they developed the diseases when they became adults. These are the diseases that they got. So their conclusion is that ancestral environmental exposures to toxicants, like Roundup, promote the epigenetic transgenerational inheritance of adult onset disease, like prostate, kidney, ovarian cancers, and birth defects. So again, as a, a grandfather, this is pretty scary. So the obvious question you should be asking is, <laughs> if it causes cancer and is killing the gut bacteria that we need, why is it still legal? One reason is that the World Health Organization asked its working group, the IARC, to come to a conclusion about it. And they concluded that glyphosate is a human carcinogen. It causes cancer. But the United States Environmental Protection Agency says, no, 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 no. Glyphosate's not a carcinogenic. Why the difference? The World Health Organization used studies that were peer reviewed, which if you know, that's the gold standard of research. Whereas the EPA used studies that were given to them by Monsanto that were not peer reviewed. So the short answer of why is glyphosate still around and why is it legal to apply, it's political, it's not scientific. The Environmental Protection Agency has backed down every time there's been a confrontation with Monsanto. And so this book, Whitewash by Carrie Gillum explains in detail why the USDA, FDA, and the EPA are still allowing it to happen. So I'll leave with the quote from Jane Goodall, 
how could we have ever believed that it was a good idea to grow our food with poisons? So we're gonna tell you a couple of different ways you can actually have an impact. Carol will talk about food and Chris about the lawn and I'll uh, talk about a little activism. So Carol. Yes, so we have a few ideas uh, on ways to reduce pesticides uh, in our food. And one of them is to buy locally grown food from farmers at the farmers markets or through uh, community supported agriculture. Uh, with the farmers, you can speak and ask and find out how they're growing their food. So you have an uh, assurance um, that if it is organically grown, you're having healthy food. But supermarkets are also responding to people's um, asking for organic food. So you can definitely talk with your supermarket if you don't see any organic food there. And uh, that will make a difference too. If you can, grow your own food, of course. Uh, and then advocate for and support regenerative agriculture wherever you can. Farmers who are trying to transition from conventionally growing food to regenerative agriculture need some support. Um, the other source that I would bring up here is uh, what the Environmental Working Group puts out. The information is uh, on one of the slides in the, in the next group of slides. Um, they put out a yearly um, a card that lists the 12 foods, produce and vegetables and fruit that have been grown with the most pesticides that you should avoid buying unless you can find them organically. Then they also have a clean 15 list uh, of foods that uh, you can buy conventionally grown because they have not been fused with pesticides. So these are some of the ideas in terms of our food intake. Chris. Change your lawn. Uh, most of us who have a backyard have grass varieties that are very short rooted and they need lots of water, especially during dry periods. So if you are reseeding, you should choose uh, grass seed varieties that have deeper roots so they can reach water that is stored lower in the soil. You can raise the blade of your mower to three or four inches high. This leaves the grass to grow higher and that will increase the photosynthesis and sequester more carbon. It also will be better at yielding food for my soil microbes. Switch to organic fertilizers. And some of the resources that we are recommending have excellent uh, lists of alternatives to artificial fertilizers. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus are uh, leading to polluting of our waterways now. So it's important to try to use as little organic, uh, artificial fertilizer as possible. Do not use pesticides. Do not use insecticides or herbicides. Uh, let dandelions grow. They are usually the first nectar that's available for bees in the spring. Um, and once your grass is growing taller, you may discover some other flowers that are growing there that will attract uh, or provide food for different types of pollinators. You can always convert part of your yard to a pollinator garden and choose native pollination, pollinating plants. Or turn your whole lawn into a meadow. You will save money. You won't be using fossil fuel because you won't need a mower and a weed whacker. And you will be amazed at the biodiversity that comes in the different in birds and other insects, butterflies, um, when you have a meadow in your yard. And of course, if you uh, can get a little bit politically active, that would be great. Talk to other parents, talk with your neighbors, find out what they're doing, and uh, form a group to stand up against pesticide application. Meet with your school administrators, the uh, parks and recreation department personnel. Let your local officials know your position. Show up at a select board meeting or whatever your governing uh, officials are called and just stand up and say, you know what? I don't want glyphosate anywhere you know, in the town. Figure out a procedure to pass uh, an ordinance, a uh, resolution to ban uh, pesticides. And if you think that's too much of a stretch, you can try to work on a moratorium. In Massachusetts, 
uh, we learned that the towns there have a health officer who is sometimes unilaterally able to uh, have a ban on pesticides because it is obviously a health issue. So contact the state representatives, state senators, urge them to ban pesticides wherever they can. Schools, town parks, playing fields, that's easy. It's public land. And then stop for newsletters, emails, and I'll show you a list in one second for groups like Beyond Pesticides and EWG is Environmental Working Group. So here's some of these websites and uh, Jess, our host is gonna make this all available. But the top one, Beyond Pesticides, has so much information, lists and lists and lists of things that you can use instead of harmful pesticides. And you look at the next to the bottom one, that's the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, that comes out with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So for more information or to contact uh, Chris, Carol, or me, you can go to Facebook and uh, type in Earth Matters and you can uh, leave your email address. One of us can get back to you. We'd be happy to do this presentation for your garden group, uh, your town officials, whoever. We're passionate and uh, happy to share it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you all for that amazingly well-prepared and thorough presentation. Um, it's a tremendous resource that you've offered folks. And right now we're going to switch over to our Q&A portion of the program. So folks, you can go ahead and bring some questions to our panelists using either the chat or the Q&A function. Great, I see there's some more resources that have been shared in the chat there. And as Carl mentioned, I'm gonna be sending out um, the resources to folks who have registered and maybe even folks who weren't able to make it this evening so that we're just all aware. As I understood, as we were preparing for this evening, um, you're really, really passionate about just getting the word out there and making sure folks have the education so that they can start taking these action steps in their communities. Um, want to also just like as we're kind of waiting for questions i was just thinking i have a, a six-year-old boy and i think it's a really you know showing up to a pta meeting or definitely kind of requesting that school administrators be aware we don't want these poisons near our children um grandparents aunties uncles all those like especially focusing on children and then acknowledging as well at the same time that under restore, historically under-resourced communities and marginalized communities are often receiving such a, such a toxic load, um, pollution, proximity to freeway, pesticide drift, it's just a mess. Wanting to know if you, if you all have any other kind of hopes uh, for this work. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna assume this is a campaign that you all are launching, but I think this would be really great to sped, spread throughout the transition movement and get folks really activated around this topic. And I see a question here from Alesa. What strategies might be most effective for banning glyphosate and for replacing toxic systems with regenerative ones? Does anyone feel called to take that one? Well, the uh, reason we're doing this, uh, Alesa, is that we're focusing right now on educating folks about it and obviously our hope and long-term goal is that we will get legislation to ban it. Um, there were a couple of bills introduced in Vermont, but believe it or not, there just was not the support for them. So they just kind of died. So that's what we're doing in this 90-day uh, challenge that we're in the middle of, is we're just going to as many people as possible to educate them about glyphosate so that when the next bill comes up, there'll be support for it. Um, I can also add that a number of states now have healthy soil legislation in place. Um, I know New Mexico passed it, I think in 2019. Um, you can Google it and find out uh, which states have uh, various, are in various stages of trying to call for more, uh, taking better care of the soil. And one of the principles of uh, regenerative soil is 
uh, to you do minimal disturbance. So that means not tilling, but it also means not putting on artificial fertilizers and pesticides, which definitely disturb the soil. Um, so working to get more uh, people involved in, in that kind of a movement state in your state would really be helpful. I see some other comments here from Leticia. Wonderful, I've learned so much, even though I've heard the presentation before. Yeah, there's just so much information there. And then Mike Bailey, what's the best way to engage with conventional farmers growing corn in our area? Are they stuck with Monsanto? Well, uh, uh, that is also a very difficult situation. Um, most dairy farmers in Vermont are trying, the conventional dairy farmers are switching over to no-till and they're beginning to use cover crops. Um, there's most concern for waterways and the phosphorus runoff into the rivers and Lake Champlain on the west side and then there's nitrogen runoff into the rivers and the Connecticut River on the, on the east side. So uh, there are several um, th uh, legislative things that have happened. And I know that there are various programs being proposed, but if you know a farmer, you know, and you feel comfortable enough asking them, you know, what do they do um, with their soil and how do they take care of it? Um, you could begin to nudge them in the right direction of encouraging them because they might have a better chance of making a little more money if they're um, raising their cows organically. Anybody else have any idea, ideas about that? Well, Mike, one of the problems is that when a conventional farmer stops using glyphosate and these other pesticides, their production will go down in the first couple of years. So one of the, the uh, parts of the legislation that's being talked about in uh, Montpelier, the capital of Vermont, just is to find a way to compensate those farmers so that they're able to ease the transition into a more regenerative organic method. But I guess the, the short answer, you know, the best way to engage a farmer, I think, is find another who's using organic methods and let them talk to them. Uh, we know someone down in the southern end here, uh, uh, Jesse, who has a, uh, he doesn't grow corn, but he's has sheep and he's brought back the soil in his farm when it was like dead, nothing, nothing grew, like bare ground. And he's used regenerative techniques. So he's very happy to talk with people. So find someone who uh, is growing corn without it. That would be the best thing. We had another question, and I did I did provide an article as well about the EPA secretary confirmation, so that looks promising. Um, another question from Anne here: Would you recommend a product for killing ticks in a private yard, and how to apply? Thank you. Um, so yeah, ticks bearing Lyme disease, and you know, folks are worried about that. How do we kind of deal with these creatures in a non-toxic way that doesn't affect the rest of the environment? <laughs> Um, I guess I have two thoughts. One is <laughs> mowing, which goes against a little bit of what Chris said, because uh, ticks uh, can't stand uh, when it's hot and dry. So they will tend to stay in the forest and not in the middle of the lawn. And my other thought is look at the Beyond Pesticides website and see what they recommend, because they have lists and lists of alternatives. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's a lot available that isn't, um, you know, poisonous. <laughs> um, and that's why barriers, you know, protecting yourself by keeping your pants tucked in and, um, is really the best. And, and trying not to venture off into the woods. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a, quite a problem here in Southern Vermont. Yeah, it's a challenge. I see also another question about how to protect pets as well. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's one of those things. Um, 
it's a bit challenging. Got to get a little bit creative and, and do some preventative measures, it sounds like. Let's see. And to see if we have any other questions. I, I did have a thought, though, as you were sharing about healthy soils. And a reminder that healthy soils sequester carbon. And a lot of communities are putting energy around climate action plans. So could there be a way within your climate action plan to make sure that pesticides are not a part of the equation because that's preventing us from having those healthy soils. And the part of the legislation in Vermont has been talked about, there's a, a piece um, called payment for ecological services mm -hmm. that would be paying farmers, ranchers to increase the carbon in their soil. And you know, the, the hard part is figuring out how to measure it and uh, but it's definitely a way to have a farmer earn a little more income from switching away from conventional to regenerative practices. Absolutely true, yeah. Any other thoughts from our panelists here? Let's see, did I get another one? Okay, we answered Anne's question. Hmm. So what would be your goal at the conclusion of this 90 day kind of education campaign? It's not, I'm going to use the word now because it sounds like that's what it is. At the conclusion of this 90 day education campaign, where would you like to see these efforts headed towards? Um, legislation that uh, there'll be uh, enough people educated to support it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, we could um, actually, uh, we were fortunate in that Carl is a member of the Conservation Commission in our town. And they agreed, everyone, the other four people um, agreed to put, a, I don't know what you would call it, Carl. Or, uh, a strong statement yeah. into the town report. Yeah, that said we should reduce the use of glyphosate in our community. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is its use along uh, right-of-ways, uh, roadsides, mm. um, and uh, along electric under electric lines. So I'm um, trying to find out from the, well, it doesn't matter. They're using something. You know, it doesn't really matter if it's glyphosate or one of the other herbicides, because there's plenty of them. Um, and finding out if there's any you know, some way to get the electric companies to stop using it because it all ends up going into the water at some point. As, as landowners, we can all write to the electric companies and uh, list the numbers of the electric poles that are on our property and request in writing, it has to be done in writing, that no glyphosate or any kind of pesticide will be sprayed on our property. So it, by educating more and more people, and this is a 90 day challenge to getting the word out, uh, this would be another way, another suggestion, for example, to have people be um, more um, uh, active in getting pesticides off the land, around the poles and wherever we can. So we just hope the dialogues will continue after mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Um, we also have a brochure that was actually written originally by the Northeast Organic Farmers Association in Massachusetts, which um, right now one of the groups that distributes food um, is putting in, has put into uh, people who pick up, they're like pre-orders. And so they've been putting that brochure into people's um, grocery bags. Um, but we'd also like to get them uh, you know, team up with some healthcare providers, mm. uh, especially nutritionists, perhaps, uh, chiropractors, naturopaths, who would be willing to put their brochures uh, in their offices so that more people would begin to ask for organic food and um, start looking to do something about the food that we have to eat. So that's part of our, our plan as part of the challenge is to begin to uh, take, find some other allies who will work with us in this 
education process. Wonderful. And I'm also, I know you, you all had shared this as a resource, um, the Pesticide Action Network. I'm curious if they, you know, if there's a way to kind of scale up a bit, if there are other folks out there who is, are as passionate as you are to kind of do some kind of coordinated effort. Um, and again, I'm thinking about the transition network in the United States here and how we can tap into that energy so that we could, what a dream it would be to just to ban glyphosate across the board in this country. Um, there is a Vermont pesticide network in Vermont and I just attended um, my first meeting with them last week. Uh, they have uh, several lawyers from the Conservation Law Foundation here in Vermont, um, a member of the uh, NOFA Vermont group. She's their policy advisor. And they've all done a lot of advocating over the years in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So they um, have been, because we do have a few bills that have been passed. Mm -hmm. um, in 2019, a neonicotinoid bill was passed uh, so that private landowners cannot just go into the drugs, I mean, into the um, hardware store and buy neonics to spray in their yards. Um, so that was the beginning. And uh, I think once the COVID problem has been taken care of, or we're at least a little more relaxed about that, we'll be able to move forward with some legislation that um, is also very important in terms of our immune system and how people have responded to this virus. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't even think, yeah, that's such a, a clear connection there. Um, it puts us as at risk. Um, the science is telling us to expect more of these kinds of things in the future. So we want our communities to be as healthy and protected and as possible. Um, absolutely, that makes so much sense. Any other questions from, from our audience here? We could also just kind of keep it going here. Um, Curious, aside from sharing the resources with folks, is there any other way that you would like to be supported with this? I know I'm excited that we have the recording of this talk that we'll be sharing. Is there anything else that you could use support with? No, just uh, whatever can get the word out, that's all. Getting the word out, okay. Get the word out and get folks activated. Yeah, and <clears throat> I think it's good for people to do more uh, learning on their own. Right. Um, to read some books that are uh, maybe more inspirational in terms of these are places that have, uh, are turning around their agricultural systems, um, however small that location could be. Um, the book, the David Montgomery book, Growing a Revolution is a great book to read. Uh, every chapter, he takes us through the history of, of um, working towards regenerative solutions mm -hmm. to the degradation of soil that has come about from our agricultural practices. Um, and also I'm reading, right now I'm reading Kiss the Ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the films, the films that are, are coming out now are also really um, very hopeful and uh, really focus on the numbers of farmers who have changed or have always been organic or growing their, their food with regenerative practices. And that's always really great to see. You can give a farmer that you do know, you can hand them a book or you know if they express an interest in it. That's great. I'm seeing a comment here from Leticia. It would be great. Oh yeah, and then the, what's making our children sick. What, it would be great if in waiting rooms at hospitals and doctor's offices, they could hear this presentation. <laughs> that would be great instead of the news <laughs> yeah or at least you know how they have magazines and pamphlets displayed in these kinds of rooms if there would be one of those brochures that chris mentioned that right you pick yeah. up and then you can see all kinds of information about what the thing and the harm that it does yeah in health food stores and, then the <laughs> and schools i keep mm -hmm. coming back to the to the schools i think that's the most devastating part about all of this is that our kids are always the most at risk here and mm -hmm. yeah 
So except for COVID, we could shop at a, uh, a PTO meeting at school and mm -hmm. do this presentation, you know, in front of all of the parents. Absolutely. But, I mean, I'll even yeah, say yeah. the the presentation was sophisticated in so many ways, and it was still clear enough that I feel like kids probably, you know, third third grade and up would probably be able to follow along and understand this. And some of the most amazing leadership around climate and protecting our planet is coming from from young people. So I definitely want to get this information into their hands as well. Yeah, we have a ban on plastic bags in the state. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, one big factor was the fact that at the time they were fifth graders, fifth grade students from Manchester Elementary School took this on on their own as a campaign. And, uh, you know, we adults just kind of helped them. But they went up and spoke with representatives and state senators. And lo and behold, we got a, a statewide ban. And I really think the kids had a lot to do with it. Wow. Yeah. I'm seeing here from Theo, lots of good articles. Yeah, some more resources. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, the information about the fact that the uh, bear is trying to influence Mexico. Uh, Carol had mentioned that they uh, put a ban on uh, GM corn and glyphosate coming into the country. And of course, Mexico is part of our uh, Canada-US uh, trade agreement. So um, Monsanto is trying to, or Bayer, excuse me, is trying to influence um, the negotiator for the trade agreement to tell Mexico that if they refuse to take the corn that they usually buy from the US farmers, it would be a violation of the, of the contract that they signed. And so they can't ban it. Um, yeah, I was very disturbed to read that. And the problem is one of the reasons they did that is because in Mexico, uh, people eat a lot more corn because they eat a lot of tortillas and um, on a daily basis, they just use more corn products than we do in this country. And so they are taking in greater quantity of glyphosate when they're eating corn that's been grown with glyphosate. And that was one of the reasons they did it. So I was just appalled to hear that, you know, we were trying to tell them, no, you can't do this. <laughs> can't stop buying our products because we grow that corn with glyphosate. That's terrible. And corn was essentially invented in Mexico and <laughs> Central America. It's a traditional ancestral food from the area. And there's just been a loss, a massive loss of biodiversity of corn species as well mm -hmm. because of this desire to commodify and grow monocultures. It's a mess. So I just want to check in with our panelists and see if there are any kind of closing thoughts or just words you'd like to share with folks who are listening. And again, reminder that we're on this 90 day kind of education challenge and so grateful for you all bringing this information to our network and, and doing the sharing that you've done. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for having us do this presentation. This is definitely a wonderful way to reach people. And just to say, I think some of the um, uh, organizations that we listed, as Carl mentioned, Beyond Pesticides, will have lots of information on various subjects, possibly even on natural ways to deal with ticks, let's say, uh, because I know that's one of the questions that we have here. Um, but there are many, many, um, incredibly valuable uh, insights that you can get from that Beyond Pesticides organization. It has helped us a lot in what we have been doing. And uh, as I say, they are out to help us practically make changes mm -hmm. in, in, in our environment. Okay. So thank uh, you for hosting. Thank you for hosting. Yes. It's my pleasure. Thank you all. Yeah, Carl or Chris, any other thoughts to, to share with folks before we wrap up? No, I'm just very grateful that, uh, you know, you took us up on our offer to present tonight. And uh, yeah, just thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, Jess, I see that Alicia is, oh yeah. So you can always share the recording uh, 
of our presentation and we would uh, really appreciate that. Um, and we really enjoyed doing it tonight to a crowd that was a little further away than just Vermont. So thank you. That's great. Yeah, we're getting the root, the, the word out and inspired by that helpful mycelium and the, the fungal <laughs> networks. That's what I'm feeling here. Um, so yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing here. We're growing the movements, the grassroots. Um, so yeah, appreciation for all of the folks that tuned in and spent their evenings with us. And yes, um, all of the resources that were shared will be sent out via email. And if you have any um, questions that you'd like to direct more specifically, um, folks can connect with you through the Earth Matters Facebook. And then um, I'm sure there's some other channels perhaps via email, that might be might be a good way to reach you all. Okay, great. So please, yeah, contact us and we'll be happy to present this to uh, whoever, church groups, parent teacher okay. groups, whoever. You heard them, take them up on the offer. Okay, and then Alesa, a group that might be interested in having this presentation given is sustainabilitynow.global. Ask mm -hmm. Alesa. Okay, definitely Alesa will be trying to connect you all. That sounds amazing. Wonderful. Right. So this is right. the Thank genius you. of our network here at, at play. <laughs> Great. Good. All right. Well, say good night to uh, everyone then. Yes. And, uh, yes. Just a big thank you again. We appreciate all the work that you did. Thank you. It's my pleasure again. Yes. Enjoy the spring. I'm enjoying yeah. the spring and I'm feeling inspired by this challenge. <laughs> good. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. And Have goodbye, everyone. Day. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs> yep. Bye. And for everyone, check out transitionus.org to learn more about our events. We have some more wonderful webinars that'll be coming up, um, especially on collaborating with local governments, which will be the topic of our April webinar. So again, kind of critical theme here, especially with what you all were mentioning. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank all you. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.